Welcome to the Linden Hills History Study Group's virtual program. Tonight's program, George Elmsley in the Shadow of Louis Sullivan, is given by Richard Cronick. We are delighted to have Richard with us. He has spoken to our group a number of times on architectural history topics. Richard is an architectural historian who brings more than three decades of research to every project. He has presented lectures and courses on the history of architecture for universities, art museums, architectural and arts association, written articles for magazines, professional journals, newsletters, and websites. His programs are always well organized, thoughtful, and comprehensive. I am impressed with the number of folks who are who have asked to be a part of this evening's Zoom presentation. Some of you live in New York, Washington, Wisconsin, and many other areas around the country. I want to welcome you. And I want to mention that Richard's presentation will be available in a couple of days on our website, lindenhillshistory.org, under the tab Updates Videos. Now I'd like to turn it over to Richard. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joellen. It is a pleasure to speak for the Linden Hills History Study Group. Um, I also want to thank David Smith, Susan Tapp, and especially August Schwerdfeger, who is handling all of the technical details for this shoot here this evening. Uh, also, last but not least at all, I want to thank Phil Wilkie, whose house I am in right now. I realize you can't see much of it at this moment, but later on in the presentation, I'll show you... Uh, several features of this house. Okay, so um, in 1935, Hugh Morrison, Louis Sullivan's first biographer, entitled his book, Louis Sullivan, Prophet of Modern Architecture. And that label has stuck. Sullivan has been enshrined in modernism's pantheon because of the innovative buildings he designed and because all modernists have adopted his famous motto, form follows function. And it turns out that a sizable chunk of Sullivan's reputation rests on eight buildings. These were the total output of his office between 1895 and 1909. This evening, I'll discuss these eight buildings one at a time, and along the way, I have five objectives. First, I hope to convince you that George Elmsley, not Louis Sullivan, should be considered the primary designer of those eight buildings. Second, I'll demonstrate that Elmsley's work in Sullivan's office has not been appropriately acknowledged. Third, I'll suggest reasons why Elmsley has not received proper credit for his work. Fourth, I'll discuss the meaning of Sullivan's idea, form follows function. And last but not least, I'll show you some examples of how Sullivan's ideas are expressed in this beautiful house uh, designed by Purcell, Fike, and Elmsley in 1911. In 1887, Chicago architect Joseph Lyman Silsby hired the 18-year-old George Elmsley as a draftsman. In Silsby's office, Elmsley worked alongside fellow draftsmen, Frank Lloyd Wright and George Washington Mayer. But late in that same year, 1887, Wright left Silsby and went to work for the firm of Adler and Sullivan. Two years later, when Adler and Sullivan needed more help, Wright recommended Elmsley, who was duly hired. Then, in 1894, Sullivan fired Wright for taking projects on the side without the boss's knowledge. And at that point, Elmsley became Sullivan's chief draftsman. One year later, 1895, Adler, who was a structural engineer, left the firm, mostly because the economic depression that began in 1893 had curtailed building nationwide and Adler needed a steady income to support his family. Elmsley remained in his role as chief draftsman until late 1909. So, in all, he worked for Louis Sullivan for 20 years, from 1889 to 1909. Both 
Elmsley and Sullivan had brilliant architectural talent, but they had diametrically opposite personalities. Sullivan, by all accounts, was pompous, compulsively bombastic, and, as Elmsley once wrote, quote, was prone to give advice where not needed to good clients, end quote. Hugh Morrison, in his Sullivan biography, called Sullivan, quote, unyielding and extremely arrogant. In stark contrast, George Elmsley was shy, quiet, and self-effacing. William Gray Purcell, Elmsley's lifelong friend and his architectural partner from 1910 to 1921, described Elmsley as, quote, not a long-distance talker, but by no means a silent person. Harold Bradley, who was Sullivan's client and later became Purcell and Elmsley's client, wrote in a letter to a friend that Elmsley was, quote, highly perceptive, a designer who brought him and his wife Josephine, quote, ideal solutions and arrangements. Bradley said, quote, we three became warm friends in the process, something we obviously could not achieve with Sullivan, end quote. Then, referring to the partnership of Purcell, Fike, and Elmsley, Bradley added that his impression was that, quote, Elmsley was the real genius of the firm. William L. Steele, who worked alongside Elmsley as a draftsman in Sullivan's office and later partnered with Elmsley on the design of the Woodbury County Courthouse in Sioux City, Iowa, summed up the relationship between Sullivan and Elmsley. Quote, Lewis dominated the scene. Elmsley remained faithful to Sullivan through it all, foregoing both activity and salary as long as it was humanly possible for him to do so. They were utterly diverse, but so equally gifted that it may have been possible for Sullivan to deceive himself as to the authorship of Elmsley's designs. He may have fancied himself as exercising hypnotic power over his self-effacing colleague. Architecturally, the result was that for the eight projects that came out of the Sullivan office from 1895 to 1909, Elmsley did almost all of the work, while Sullivan has received almost all of the credit. For example, I recently checked Wikipedia and found that for the eight buildings under consideration here, the Guarantee Building, the Bayard Building, the Gage Brothers facade, and the Schlesinger and Mayer store are credited solely to, El to Sullivan. The National Farmers Bank is described as designed by Sullivan with decorative elements by George Elmsley. Only the Bradley House is described as designed by Lewis H. Sullivan and George Grant Elmsley. There currently are no Wikipedia articles for the Felsenthal store or the Babson House. Also, the current Wikipedia article on Sullivan credits all buildings to Sullivan and never mentions George Elmsley. Okay, so now I'll cover the eight buildings. Uh, in time order, starting with the Guarantee Building in Buffalo, which is one of the best examples of Sullivan's idea that the tallness of a tall building should be accentuated with continuous vertical lines. In a 1932 letter to Frank Lloyd Wright, Elmsley claimed that he, Elmsley, that is, had designed all of the ornamentation for the Guarantee Building, with the exception of the ornamental iron. Hugh Morrison, Sullivan's biographer, described the division of labor a little bit differently. Morrison said Elmsley had designed the exterior, with the exception of the capitals of the columns, which were designed by Sullivan. Otherwise, Morrison agreed with Elmsley that Elmsley had designed the remainder of the building's exterior. David Gebhard, who wrote extensively on Purcell and Elmsley and their relationships with Sullivan, generally corroborated Elmsley's claim, stating that, quote, with the inheritance of Sullivan's theory of decoration, Elmsley developed his own individual interpretations, starting with the Guarantee Building, end quote. This blueprint that you're seeing on the left of the screen right now 
is one of the uh, is a drawing of one of the guarantee building's entrances, uh, and it's one of several uh, drawings for the guarantee building that I photographed at the library of the Chicago Art Institute. Um, and at the bottom right corner, I've blown up the uh, signature block there, uh, bottom right of your screen, uh, and it is clearly signed with Elmsley's typical GGE signature. Um, and uh, I want to uh, show you in addition, uh, I'm going to enlarge the drawing, just the uh, top uh, uh, center of the, of the drawing. And I do that just because I want you to see how much detail Elmsley would put into a drawing that wasn't really the drawing for any of this ornament. There would be full-size drawings made later uh, for this. But Elmsley was meticulous uh, putting detail like this into a drawing. Many writers have assumed that Sullivan personally designed the Bayard Building in Greenwich Village in New York City. For example, in 1899, the architecture critic Montgomery Schuyler declared that the building's lavish ornament is of a quality that no other designer could have commanded, and of course, he was referring to Sullivan. Paul Sprague, wrote his 1968 Ph.D. dissertation on the ornamental designs of Sullivan, Elmsley, and Frank Lloyd Wright. Sprague speculated that ornamental motifs used in the Bayard building's facade were copied from earlier designs produced by the Sullivan office. Sprague pointed out that Elmsley never claimed credit for these earlier buildings and that, therefore, According to Sprague, Elmsley should not receive much credit for the design of the building. Frank Lloyd Wright imagined that Sullivan considered the Bayard building one of his best designs, but Wright had no basis for assuming Sullivan had designed the building. As I said earlier, Sullivan fired Wright in 1894, and Wright was totally out of contact with Sullivan throughout the period when the Bayard building was designed. Despite these and other assumptions that Sullivan designed the Bayard Building, David Gebhard, who wrote his 1957 Ph.D. dissertation on Purcell and Elmsley, said Elmsley was, quote, unquestionably responsible for the Bayard Building's structural concept and plan. But Elmsley himself went further. In a 1938 letter to architect Claude Bragdon, Elmsley wrote that Sullivan, quote, brought Swedish artist Andreas Zorn into the drawing room where I was at work making the designs and drawings for the ornamental work on the Bayard building in New York. Sullivan was perfectly open in letting people know what I did. There was no secret about it. From 1895 to 1909, I did every lick of it. Sullivan's general feeling was that I did it as well as he himself could, and allowed me to develop forms as I chose, end quote. Stanley McCormick, grandson of Cyrus McCormick and heir to the International Harvester's Fortune, financed three side-by-side -side buildings on Chicago's Michigan Avenue, all built to house millinery companies. The architectural firm of Holabird and Roach was chosen to design two of the three buildings, but the Gage brothers, who were to occupy the northernmost of the three, insisted that Sullivan should be retained to design their building's facade. Again, many writers have simply assumed that Sullivan designed the Gage brothers' facade. For example, Paul Sprague thought the facade was, quote, the ripe work of a mature artist, end quote, and of course he meant Sullivan. But Elmsley, in the 1932 letter to Frank Lloyd Wright that I quoted earlier, complained that Wright, in his autobiography, was, quote, greatly in error in his statements that Elmsley's work about, about, in his statements about Elmsley's work in Sullivan's office. Elmsley claimed he had designed all of the ornament for the gauge facade. William Purcell, in an unpublished essay entitled Gage Building, said, quote, 
Development of the gauge project design and initiation of concept and detail was placed entirely in George's hands. Not, of course, without preliminary review and continuous conference on all factors bearing upon it. End quote. Purcell then quoted Elmsley as saying, quote, This was the first project in which I was permitted to express the form and ornament as I felt in complete freedom. David Gebhardt backed up Elmsley, insisting that, quote, The actual realization of the building and the design of the ornament and details were mostly Elmsley's. The architecture critic Lewis Mumford, in his classic book, The Brown Decades, said the the Schlesinger and Mayer store, later renamed Carson Peary Scott, was the finest work of Sullivan's last years. Paul Sprague, in his dissertation, analyzed individual components of the cast iron ornament surrounding the first two floors of the store. While Sprague conceded that Elmsley had designed most of that ornament, he nonetheless decided that certain parts of the ornament were, quote, of such superior quality that their designer presumably was Sullivan himself, end quote. Sprague made a lot of presumptions in this way. William Purcell was well aware of these claims, and he wrote an unpublished essay to rebut them. Purcell wrote that, quote, all the Schlesinger and Mayer ornament of their 1904 building was from the hand of George G. Elmsley. Then, taking a jab at Sullivan, Purcell added that, quote, there was no one else in the office at that time capable of doing such work. In fact, Purcell had been an eyewitness to Elmsley's design work. Purcell wrote that when he worked as a draftsman in Sullivan's office in 1903, he had, quote, sat on a stool day after day and watched George draw all the S and M detail, end quote. Purcell reported that when these drawings were finished, they were sent to the Edmund Manufacturing Company, quote, as fast as produced, end quote. Then, as if to shout in frustration at his reader, he added in all capital letters, and Sullivan never saw any of it. In addition to the Schlesinger and Mayer ornament, Elmsley claimed he had designed the store's curved corner. In a 1936 letter to Frank Lloyd Wright, that's a different letter than the one I've already quoted from, Elmsley wrote that Sullivan, quote, established the window shapes in the upper story, I did all the rest, including the design of the shape and the complete working out of the projecting curved corner tower, which was not on the original design, end quote. Purcell, who had watched Elmsley produce the design, remembered that Elmsley had made, quote, two or three, or I think even three or four different preliminary studies as to how this corner might be handled. David Gebhard supported Elmsley's and Purcell's claims, quote, as Elmsley matured, his responsibilities in the work produced by the Sullivan office became greater until, in fact, the last of the buildings were almost entirely from his hand. Unquestionably, the structural concept and the plan of the Schlesinger and Mayer store was Sullivan's, but the actual realization of the building and the design of the ornament and details were mostly Elmsley's. Eli Felsenthal was Dankmar Adler's friend and attorney. In 1906, Felsenthal hired Sullivan to design a store building with apartments above at 701 East 47th Street on Chicago's south side. Three decades later, Purcell and Elmsley collaborated on an unpublished essay that they wrote in Elmsley's voice. In it, Elmsley claims that, quote, the general concept of the Felsenthal store was developed in conference with Mr. Sullivan, with the usual memorandum drawings of record, all working drawings of this store, details of ornament, etc., were mine, and also the pulling of it all into a harmonious whole, uh, end quote. That, that statement that Elmsley just made about 
uh, the usual memorandum drawings of record, that's important. Elmsley explained in other letters and essays that for most buildings, Sullivan would produce quick sketches and Elmsley would take it from there. Paul Sprague agreed, pointing out that the ornament on the Felsenthal store is characteristic of the style Elmsley continued to develop throughout his career. And I agree, uh, and I'll point out one aspect of Elmsley's style that I think is actually a key to understanding him. Uh, what I'm showing you here in the upper right of the screen is a terracotta tile. There were two examples of it made. I'm showing you where they were on the original building. And uh, I want to point out to you the form that is uh, in the tile. Uh, it's this light colored form right here. It has four lobes. And uh, here are some uh, uh, Another example of it is the same tile at the bottom. At the top, this is where Elmsley got it from. Uh, the drawing on the left is by Sullivan. It is for a baluster, an iron baluster that was in the Guarantee building. And on the right is one of the balusters uh, that was actually produced. And notice that this form, the four-lobed uh, uh, form, is right in the smack dab center of it. Uh, here are three other examples, all from Purcell, uh, Fike, and Elmsley. Uh, well, one from a Purcell and Elmsley design. Uh, but these are all designed by George Elmsley, and they feature that same form. So the question is, what is it? I believe that this form represents the soul of a human being. Um, I furthermore would uh, suggest that it is an abstraction of the famous drawing by Leonardo da Vinci called Vitruvian Man. Uh, Leonardo wrote that uh, his aim in making that drawing was to uh, think about how do humans fit into nature. And going back to uh, the, uh, the previous slide, this is exactly what George Elmsley is showing us. Notice that all of the material around the four-lobed form is plant life. And so he's showing us that humans are part of nature. There has been a scholarly argument about who designed the 1909 Babson House. Willard Connolly, who authored a 1960 biography of Sullivan, and Narciso Menocal, a professor at the University of Wisconsin, both wrote that Sullivan had designed the house. Others, including Paul Sprague and Hugh Morrison, credited, Elm credited Elmsley with the design. William Purcell, in another unpublished essay entitled George, Elm Grant, excuse me, George Grant Elmsley Biographical Source Material, attempted to set the record straight. Purcell stated emphatically that the Babson House was, quote, done by George Grant Elmsley and not by Sullivan. Purcell supported his claim with three points. Quote, first, of course, Sullivan was never interested in domestic architecture. When Wright was with the firm, he and Elmsley did most of the residential work. When Wright left the office, Elmsley took over this aspect of the firm's work. Second, the actual sketches, presentation drawings, and the final working drawings are from Elmsley's hand. Third, it was the type of design which Elmsley continued in his own work and in that of Purcell and Elmsley, end quote. Um, and as I'm showing on the screen, the Babson house has been demolished. The light fixture which uh, was in the house on the right uh, is uh, on display at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Only one bank was designed in the Sullivan office while Elmsley worked there, the National Farmers Bank in Owatonna, Minnesota. In a letter to Lewis Mumford, Elmsley stated that when Sullivan returned from his first trip to Owatonna, quote, he had some palm of the hand sketches of requirements and a study for the design. His design embodied three arches on each of the two fronts, uh, 
I suggested a great 36-foot arch instead of the three. The building was so built. I made every drawing for the building, every detail, every ornament without exception, as well as establishing its characteristic motif, the big arch. However, several authors have disputed Elmsley's claim. Paul Sprague, in his dissertation, quoted Elmsley's claim in the letter to Mumford that I just wrote, uh, uh, the claim that Elmsley had designed the bank. But then Sprague imagined, and I would say without evidence, that, quote, obviously Elmsley did not mean to take credit for the planning of the bank, for the conception of the great 40-foot high unobstructed interior space, for the lighting through skylight and side windows, for the structural and mechanical systems, for the choice of materials, for the scheme of coloration, or for the location of ornaments and ornamented areas. That's a whole lot of assumption. To cap off his argument, Sprague criticized Elmsley's work with Purcell, conjecturing that Sullivan should receive some of the credit for the Oatana Bank's ornament because the bank's ornamental details are, quote, so much more satisfactorily integrated into the fabric of the building than was the case in Elmsley's work after 1909, end quote. In her book, Louis... Louis H. Sullivan, the, the Banks, Lauren Weingarten even rejected Elmsley's claim that the big arches were his idea because Sullivan had used the single arch motif on earlier projects. And the historian William Geordie, in a book of essays on Sullivan, claimed, amazingly to me, that Sullivan should get full credit for designing the bank because the design process followed the methodology Sullivan had learned at the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris, in which an original sketch was the controlling document and all further elaboration was done, quote, without substantial deviation from the original sketch. Um, that, again, is just an uh, assumption about how the design process worked. In contrast, Hugh Morrison, William Purcell, and David Gebhardt defended Elmsley. Morrison, who depended heavily on correspondence with Elmsley for his Sullivan biography, agreed that Elmsley should be credited with the design of the bank, adding that, quote, Elmsley, who was never a formal partner of Sullivan, was at this time a truer collaborator in design than Adler had ever been, end quote. Purcell, in one of his many unpublished essays, claimed because Elmsley had taken over the design of nearly all ornament in the Sullivan office beginning in 1895, that by 1906, Sullivan was out of practice and couldn't have produced the designs that Elmsley could turn out almost effortlessly. Purcell pointed out that the many details of the bank's design were unlikely to have been sketched or even thought of in Sullivan's quickly done, quote, palm of the hand sketches. David Gebhardt, in his dissertation, quoted Purcell, stating that the only component of the bank designed by Sullivan was a terracotta ornament in a soffit under the big arches on the bank's interior. And here's what he was talking about. Uh, I'm showing you the, the band of ornament on the left, uh, which goes all the way up around the, this uh, big stencil on the wall. Uh, that's by Sullivan, and the band to its right is by Elmsley, uh, as were the, the row of uh, sort of greenish terracotta that's underneath all of that. And uh, to me, this photograph is kind of like a Rosetta Stone. It gives you an opportunity to uh, compare Sullivan's style with Elmsley's style. Uh, Sullivan, to me, all of his ornament looks, and this is a good example of it, looks like it's in, intention. All the lines seem to be taut, whereas Elmsley's ornament always seems to me relaxed, sort of fat and happy uh, in comparison. Harold Bradley, a professor of physiology at the University of Wisconsin, became Sullivan's client by marriage. Bradley's wife was Josephine Crane, the daughter of Charles Crane, 
president of the well-known Crane Plumbing Company of Chicago. After Adler and Sullivan had designed an office building and several factories for the Crane Company, Charles Crane hired Sullivan to design a house in Madison as a gift to the Bradleys, his daughter and son-in-law. In a 1965 letter, Bradley told the story of how the Madison house was designed. Quote, Sullivan, whom we enjoyed in spite of his insistence on dominating the plans, seemed to deteriorate. He was obviously and often under the influence of liquor. Not drunk, but somewhat tipsy, sometimes vague or sleepy. He turned things over more and more to George Elmsley, whom we liked very much and who seemed to understand our problems perfectly. Elmsley eventually came up for all the conferences, worked with Mrs. B on furniture design, decorations, etc. We saw little or nothing of Sullivan anymore. The Bradley and Crane families later hired Purcell and Elmsley to design a second house in Madison and several buildings at the Crane family retreat in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. This house at Woods Hole, which is nicknamed the Bradley Bungalow by Purcell and Elmsley, uh, also has been nicknamed the Airplane House because of its cantilevered second floor. Okay, so that takes us through all eight of the buildings, and I hope I've convinced you that George Elmsley should, at the very least, be credited as the co-designer, if not the designer, of all eight of them. So the next obvious question, I think, is why didn't Sullivan contribute more to those designs? The answer, sadly, was implied in Harold Bradley's letter that I just quoted. Sullivan had become increasingly incapacitated by alcoholism. And Bradley's statement has been corroborated many times. Even Frank Lloyd Wright, whose 1949 book, Genius and the Mobocracy, is an homage to Sullivan, wrote that Sullivan, quote, was addicted to smoking, drinking, and whoring to a dreadful extreme. Here's another example. In December 1909, Elmsley wrote to Carl Bennett, the CEO of the National Farmers Bank, quote, Mr. Sullivan told me last Saturday that the end had come as far as working for him was concerned. He is keeping up his drinking, and I do not know how much longer he or any man can stand it. Larry Millett, in his book about the Owatonna Bank, wrote that, quote, For all the discipline he brought to his work, Sullivan was never able to master his own appetites and passions. His drinking and carousing made him something of a notorious figure in Chicago. When Sullivan was too drunk or too ornery to deal with clients, Elmsley would step in to smooth things over. End quote. Elmsley remembered that he got quite so frightfully lonesome at times, especially when the master came in late in the day very glazed in the eye. Unhappy man. Because of Sullivan's excessive drinking, after Elmsley left Sullivan, Carl Bennett, the CEO of the Owatonna Bank, began pulling away from Sullivan. When other Midwestern bankers who had seen or read about the National Farmers Bank asked Bennett to re recommend an architect, he forwarded their letters to Purcell, Fike, and Elmsley, not to Sullivan. Purcell and Fike had produced designs for three small-town banks before Elmsley joined them in early 1910, but the Bennett referrals turned the firm of Purcell, Fike, and Elmsley into bank design specialists. The referrals from Bennett resulted in at least four more built banks, and in all, between 1908 and the end of the Purcell and Elmsley partnership in 1921, the firm produced new or remodeled designs for 14 bank buildings in Minnesota, Wisconsin, North and South Dakota, Nebraska, and Illinois. In comparison, Sullivan from 1910, that's when Elmsley left him, until his death in 1924, designed six banks. 
Bennett did invite Sullivan to compete for the job of designing a new Owatonna High School, and Sullivan was selected by the school board, but then Sullivan proceeded to lose the commission by getting into a drunken shouting argument with one of the school board members. I think it's clear that in the language of today's alcoholism treatment industry, George Elmsley became Louis Sullivan's enabler. The Hazelden Betty Ford Foundation says, quote, for an alcoholic to continue drinking, non-alcoholics must be unwittingly involved in enabling the alcoholic's drinking, end quote. So with the combination of deep respect for Sullivan and his introverted, self-effacing personality, George Elmsley just kept his head down and did the lion's share of the work, thereby allowing Sullivan to fall deeper and deeper into his addiction while maintaining the fiction that he was working. But then, for the rest of his life, Elmsley was torn between his deep respect for Sullivan and his knowledge that Sullivan had taken advantage of him. In a 1917 letter to Purcell, Elmsley unburdened himself, quote, I have never gotten over those LHS years of giving all and getting nothing. It was too long an experience of master and man you can't dream of how queer a situation it was, end quote. In 1958, six years after Elmsley's death, Purcell wrote in a letter that, quote, George just didn't have the self-starter. He was always subconsciously resentful that Sullivan didn't take him in as a full partner, plus the fact that he continued to support and work for Sullivan during 1908, 1909, and part of 1910, and never received one dollar in salary, end quote. The historian Roger Kennedy, who was a personal friend of William Purcell, wrote that by the late 1890s, Elmsley, quote, became Sullivan's unadmitted partner. The firm gradually lost ground to Daniel Burnham and his followers, and finally, in the long years of Sullivan's despondency and alcoholism, with infrequent commissions, Elmsley was his nurse and custodian. At this point, I'd like to add a shout out to my colleague, Dominic Ferry, who lives in Glasgow, Scotland, and has researched George Elmsley. Dominic has theorized that a willful error in the Elmsley family immigration papers may have been partly to blame for George's quiet demeanor. When they arrived in the U.S. from Scotland, Elmsley's parents stated that George was two years younger than he actually was so he could be admitted into the U.S. as a dependent child. Dominic Ferry thinks one reason George was habitually quiet and didn't have the self-starter, as Purcell put it, was that throughout the rest of his life, George was worried that he might be discovered as an illegal alien and deported. Despite all the clear evidence that Elmsley had a lot to do with the design of these eight buildings, a virtual parade of writers seem to have gone out of their way to discredit Elmsley and his role in Sullivan's office. Of these writers, Frank Lloyd Wright has probably done the most damage. In his 1943 autobiography, Wright, as part of describing life in Sullivan's office, wrote that, quote, George wasn't a minister's son, but ought to have been. He was a tall, slim, slow-thinking, but faithful Scottish lad who had never really been young, very quiet and diffident, end quote. Wright wrote a similarly condescending description of Elmsley in his later book about Sullivan, entitled Genius and the Mobocracy. Elmsley, though shy in person, could be forceful in correspondence. After reading Wright's autobiography, he fired off a three-page letter to Wright 
which I have quoted a couple of times already this evening, in which he angrily rebutted Wright's slurs. Quote, your references to your contacts in days past, with more or less gratuitous insults to some of us whom you met, were entirely out of place in any serious biography. One of us was slow-thinking, anemic, diffident, and never young. Another was covered with pimples and blushed. So little, alas, of grace and delicacy in any of your comments about others. I fail to feel a real and abiding interest in all that garrulous miscellany. How you could have put it in baffles me. Because Wright has loomed so large in the history of architecture, and because his autobiography has been so widely read, several later writers apparently took Wright's words on face value. For example, David Van Zanten, in his book Sullivan's City, which is, is an interpretation of Sullivan's architecture, referred to Elmsley only once, and then as Sullivan's faithful, faithful but meddling chief draftsman. Willard Connolly, in his 1960 Sullivan biography, appeared to enjoy embellishing Wright's put-down of Elmsley. Conley's book was intended as a popular rather than a scholarly biography, and as such, it contains no footnotes. So, without citing any source, Conley wrote that Elmsley was a, quote, pupil in architecture, shy and tractable, end quote. And then, based on nothing more than this serious-faced photograph of the young Elmsley, Conley went on to imagine that George Elmsley, quote, wore a look of engaging meekness and looked a bit as if he were about to burst into tears. Paul Sprague, whom I've quoted several times, has repeatedly criticized Elmsley. This began in 19, a 1967 article about the Owatonna Bank in which Sprague denied Elmsley's Purcells and Gebbard's assertions that Elmsley essentially had designed the entire bank. For example, referring to the bank's intricate cast iron teller's wickets, Sprague imagined, with no evidence, I would point out, that Elmsley was, quote, probably following some minuscule sketch by Sullivan. Then, in Sprague's dissertation, completed one year later in 1968, he expanded his attack on Elmsley. In a discussion of the Bayard Building in New York City, Sprague acknowledged that Elmsley, uh, that Elmsley claimed authorship of the design, but then, based on nothing other than his own judgments that certain elements are inharmonious with the overall scheme, Sprague decided that the more harmonious elements must have been designed by Sullivan, while the less harmonious ones must have been by Elmsley. Sprague went on to criticize Elmsley again in later writings. In a chapter of a 2004 book on the Charnley House in Chicago, Sprague again quoted Elmsley's claim that he had designed the Owen a bank, and then dismiss, dismissed the claim, saying that because Sullivan had come back from Oatana with sketches, quote, it becomes clear that Sullivan actually did make a design for the bank, presumably in plan and obviously in elevation. And I'm, of course, emphasizing presumably and obviously. Uh, this is a lot of what Sprague did. In addition to Wright's disparaging description of Elmsley and later publications that were probably influenced by it, there's another factor that soured writers on Elmsley. Sullivan, who died in 1924, had appointed Elmsley as his literary executor. And during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, Elmsley gave some of Sullivan's drawings and other documents to Columbia University and others to the Art Institute of Chicago. However, also in the 1920s, Elmsley destroyed all of Sullivan's diaries, which many writers would like to have seen. This is very likely what David Van Zanten referred to when he described Elmsley as Sullivan's meddling chief draftsman. In 1958, William Purcell wrote that he was shocked when Elmsley told him he had discarded the diaries. 
But Purcell must have forgotten that 20 years earlier, Elmsley had explained to Purcell that he destroyed the diaries because they, quote, were business notes only and many indications of meeting this mistress and that. So out they went, end quote. In other words, Elmsley actually was trying to protect his ex-boss from prying eyes, who he feared, probably with good cause, uh, would place the most lurid details of Sullivan's personal life before the public. Hugh Morrison, Sullivan's biographer, wrote that Elmsley and other Sullivan friends, quote, were so fiercely loyal to Sullivan's memory that they would let nothing escape which might seem in the least discreditable. Only a handful of historians, Morrison, Gebhardt, Larry Mallett, and a couple of others, have tried to counter the many negative appraisals of Elmsley. Mallett in The Curve of the Arch, his book on the Owatonna Bank, wrote that, quote, For two decades, through good times and bad, Elmsley was the indispensable man in Sullivan's life, and when work needed to be done, it was usually Elmsley who ended up doing it because Sullivan was often absent from the office for long periods, end quote. So this, I think, raises the next question, which is, why have so many writers uh, tried their damnest, damnedest <laughs> to denigrate George Elmsley? The answer goes back to the very first point I made tonight. It's all about the virtual canonization of Louis Sullivan, making him the so-called prophet of modern architecture. In the first few decades of the 20th century, the newly energized modernists tried to sweep away all historical reference architecture and with it, all ornament. In 1908, the Austrian architect Adolf Loos published an influential lecture entitled Ornament and Crime. In 1927, the French architect Le Corbusier proclaimed that a house should be a machine for living in. And many other writers, including Siegfried Gideon, James Marston Fitch, and Lewis Mumford, published their histories of modernism. Earlier, I quoted Mumford's 1931 book, The Brown Decades, in which he declared that the Schlesinger and Mayer store was the best work of Sullivan's last years. But what Mumford liked was only the clean, white, proto-modernist system of rectangular windows and what he called the logical solution of the round corner entrance tower, which, of course, he thought had been designed by Sullivan. Mumford also thought the cast iron ornament around the show windows had been designed by Sullivan, but he described it as a departure from the logic that destroyed the building's unity of expression. So by the time Hugh Morrison was researching and writing his Sullivan biography in the early 1930s, Modernism was firmly established as architecture's new paradigm, and, like Mumford, Morrison was apparently embarrassed by the Schlesinger and Mayer store's cast-iron ornament, calling it, quote, the most debatable feature of the design, end quote. He never discussed the ornament as art. Instead, he emphasized only its engineering aspect, writing that, Quite apart from its decorative value, the ornament represents an amazing technical achievement. And except for a few people who were close to George Elmsley, as far as anyone knew, Elmsley's contribution to Sullivan's architecture was only the oh-so-embarrassing ornament, which was not true. Elmsley contributed to every aspect of the architecture. But that's all most people knew. And so Sullivan became a prophet, and George Elmsley became an inconvenient truth, a persona non grata in the pantheon. Writers found that in order to deify Sullivan, it became necessary to downplay or denigrate Elmsley or to completely ignore him. To put it in today's slang, George Elmsley was thrown under the bus. He lived until 1952 and watched all this happen. 
Can you imagine how it made him feel? Furthermore, in order to elevate Sullivan to the status of a saint, it became necessary to either downplay or outright deny his alcoholism. Kenneth Frampton, in his foreword to Lauren Weingarten's book on Sullivan's banks, stated that it was a myth that Sullivan was an alcoholic. Willard Conley soft-pedaled the drinking, mentioning it only once in his Sullivan biography, and then saying only that Sullivan, quote, had grown a little fond of the bottle. Meanwhile, modernists twisted Sullivan's words to fit their new aesthetic concept. When they read, form follows function, they thought function referred only to the structural aspect of a building, which they said must be expressed on the building's uh, exterior surface uh, as an expression of honesty. They were either unaware of or tried to hide the fact that Sullivan, Purcell, Elmsley, and a few others had often stated that the most important function of architecture was its spiritual function. For example, Sullivan wrote, quote, I value spiritual results only. I say spiritual results proceed all other, excuse me, precede all other results and indicate them. I can see no efficient way of handling the relationship between ornament and structure on any other than a spiritual or psychic basis. End quote. William Purcell echoed Sullivan over and over in his writings. In a letter to David Gebhardt, for example, Purcell wrote that Purcell and Elmsley, quote, were not modern as that word is now defined, nor were they trying to be original. They were never in any doubt about the meaning of the word function. Their work strived to acknowledge every function, social, intellectual, poetic, spiritual, tradition, and all the other relations of the full life. End quote. Sullivan, Purcell, and Elmsley believed that the leafy naturalistic ornament had two meanings. First, it was intended to remind us that our spirituality arises from our relationship with nature, an idea they credited to the transcendentalists, Emerson, Thoreau, and Whitman. And second, the ornament was an exuberant expression of the culmination of the organic design process. Elmsley wrote that the ornament, quote, was the exfoliation of a germinal idea. It seemed a reasonable idiom to use and for people to enjoy, and they did enjoy it. A lot of it may be compared to music. One critic was kind enough to liken some work I did for the master to a Schubert song. So, Elmsley's story, as I hope you understand, is a sad story. After the strange 20 years with Sullivan, he did experience a couple of happy years with Purcell and Fike. But then, his wife of just two years died of sepsis in a Chicago hospital, and he really never recovered from that shock. He developed a habit of over-designing, producing drawings for more than clients wanted or could afford. Purcell wrote that it became necessary for other members of the firm to try to restrain Elmsley. And ironically, both Elmsley and Sullivan died in sadness and relative obscurity. But, as I said, there were a couple of happy years, and this house, uh, which Purcell, Fike, and Elmsley designed in 1911 for Oscar and Catherine Owry, is a wonderful example of their work. Mr. Owry was a dentist. Uh, so, the last thing I want to do tonight is to show you how Sullivan's philosophical ideas are represented in the architecture here. The doors of the bookcases are a wonderful example of Elmsley's design work in uh, art glass. And as you can see, uh, the forms in the glass represent growing plants. Uh, and so again, this is to remind us that we are part of nature and are connected to nature. 
And here at the fireplace, we have a wonderful example of how Purcell and Elmsley, following the ideas of Sullivan, used materials. Uh, everything is used naturalistically. The brick is presented as brick. The wood is not stained. It's not painted. It's just got uh, a coating of wax, I think was what Purcell and Elmsley would have uh, uh, prescribed. And we have stone in the corners. And all of these are presented as themselves. Uh, there's no such thing as putting up a plaster wall and then scoring the plaster to make it look like stone blocks. So there's an element of honesty involved in the use of the materials. Another good example of how Purcell and Elmsley interpreted Sullivan's ideas is in the, their well-known open plan. And so here we have the sunroom at the front of the house, and it's just one continuous connected space from the sunroom coming into the living room uh, and then going around the fireplace and into the dining room. And along the way, we come by all these south-facing windows. So again, it's opening up everything to nature uh, and making the connection between human and nature. Um, outside the house, uh, when we look at it from, uh, uh, from the street, it's quite clear that the house was placed as far to the north on the lot as possible, and that is to get greater light into all of these south-facing windows. Uh, so once again, it's a about connection with nature. And then the last thing I wanted to show you is this little panel of fret sawn wood, which is uh, just above the front door of the house. And it includes one of those uh, forms, the four lobed uh, form that I mentioned earlier that uh, represent the soul of a human and uh, is placed within growing foliage. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am finished with my presentation. I'd be very happy to take any questions or hear your comments. Thanks very much. Okay, so somebody, uh, Ruth, asked, when was the Felsenthal store demolished? Um, I don't know the exact date, Ruth. Um, it must have been around 1960. Uh, there was a, a photographer in the 1950s who got a grant to photograph all of Sullivan's work that was still extant. And uh, the photograph that I showed you of the store is one of his photos. Um, is that Richard Nickel? So, yep, exactly right, Richard Nickel. Uh, and that's all of his photos are published in a book. Um, so anyway, that that's, it must have been probably in the 60s. Uh, but I, I'd, I'd have to go double check and figure that out. Uh, and then Mimi Fisher uh, happens to be my sister. Uh, so, so, hi, Mimi. <laughs> said, did Elmsley himself try to take credit for these buildings? Yeah, that's the point I'm making here. Uh, <laughs> Or was he so retiring in demeanor that he either didn't care or was okay with giving someone else the credit? Uh, and have I ever thought of correcting or challenging the entry in Wikipedia about all these buildings? Um, it, it's really complicated. You know, Elmsley's attitude, I tried to, to characterize. He, uh, he was a, of two minds. He absolutely revered Sullivan. He thought Sullivan was, uh, you know, like the, uh, he, he once described him as like one sitting on Olympus uh, uh, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, he was so angry that Sullivan had, uh, had taken tremendous advantage of him, didn't pay him for a couple of years. Uh, he was living with his sisters. Uh, he had several sisters in Chicago, and they were pretty much supporting him. Um, and so uh, he 
had this shy demeanor and he couldn't really bring himself to uh, say what, you know, a more forthright and self uh, um, confident person would have said to Sullivan. Uh, he couldn't leave. Uh, he only could leave when it was absolutely the end of things. And, uh, you know, there was no more work in the office, uh, or not quite that, but there wasn't much. Um, and, uh, and then he had this safety valve, which was uh, William Purcell, who had been inviting him to come to Minneapolis for several years. Uh, and they, they, they had become friends way, way back in, uh, uh, in, uh, in my presentation. I said Purcell started working in Sullivan's office in 1903. He was only there for about a half year. Um, but uh, the reason he got uh, in a job in Sullivan's office was that he met George Elmsley at a, a, a cocktail party. And within a couple of days, uh, Elmsley had brought him into uh, Sullivan's office. So uh, from the very beginning of this period, well, I'm not quite the beginning, but very uh, close to the beginning, um, uh, Purcell was saying, God, you should just leave Sullivan. Come on to Minneapolis. We're, we've got a growing business. We could really use you. So it was this very complicated situation. Um, have I thought of correcting and challenging the entries in Wikipedia? Uh, I might get around to that. What I'm doing at the moment is writing an article that's a, uh, a version of what I've presented tonight. And actually, I hope to get it published in uh, maybe the, the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians. I've talked with the editor of that uh, about this possibility. Uh, and uh, that, that might be a, a, a hard sell. That's a peer reviewed uh, uh, go journal. For it. And I'm going to go for it. But um, uh, maybe <laughs> if that uh, doesn't happen, there will be other possibilities, maybe uh, Minnesota history or something like that. So uh, Wikipedia, I don't know, maybe I'll get around to that sometime. I'd rather publish it more substantially uh, yeah. in, in a journal. My next uh, question on the list here is from uh, my friend Catherine Furry. Is Sprague alive? Yes, uh, Professor Sprague is 87 years old. Uh, he retired, he was a professor at, uh, at the end of his career at um, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Uh, and, and he's led a distinguished career in many ways. He uh, 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 was instrumental in creating a master list of historic buildings all over Illinois. And um, Professor Sprague and I have, uh, I, I'll go ahead and say it, we've had a run-in once before. Um, we are both members of an organization. It's the Walter Burley Griffin Society. And uh, so I see Professor Sprague at annual meetings of the society. And um, in, uh, let's see, I believe it was 2010, uh, the society met here in uh, Minneapolis and specifically at the Northwest Architectural Archives. And I was the uh, keynote speaker and I spoke on Purcell and Elmsley and I presented uh, uh, the idea that I've uh, gotten into this evening about um, what those four lobed uh, 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 forms mean. Uh, my, and you heard my suggestion that I think it represents the soul of a human. Uh, and, and, some, and I went into further other, other uh, ornamental motifs that Elmsley used all the time and talked about what I thought they meant. And, Right at the end of my presentation, Professor Sprague, uh, I would characterize it as he came storming up to the podium and with fire in his eyes said to me, have you published this? Uh, and uh, so, and then we, we've had a little uh, disagreements about interpretation of architecture uh, in other ways during these meetings. So, um, uh, Perhaps Professor, Professor Sprague will see this uh, presentation and maybe I'll hear from him. Uh, I'll be happy to duke it out with him, <laughs> virtually, of course. Uh, see, Ruth says, yeah, no such thing as AA and 12 steps in Sullivan's day, absolutely correct. 
Uh, yeah, and then um, I also responded to Shay when you read um, Elmsley's uh, comeback to uh, yeah, to right. Um, if only he could have been, you know, more forthright. And another thing that is frustrating to me is, um, you know, I mentioned many times in my presentation that uh, Purcell made a lot of his uh, points in essays that he never published. Uh, and so Purcell was on one side of it, Elmsley's uh, protector and, uh, and defender. And when I say that, um, toward the end of Elmsley's life, Purcell was bankrolling him. Uh, Purcell was independently wealthy. His father was a millionaire and he inherited all that wealth. Uh, and Elmsley was destitute almost, living with his sisters at the end of his life. And Purcell sent him money quite often. So, uh, and then I told you about how Purcell, uh, uh, when Elmsley joined Purcell and Fike in Minneapolis, uh, Elmsley was so sort of peevish and, and uh, uh, compulsive that he would often design buildings way beyond what the clients could afford. And everybody in the office was trying to hold him back, uh, including Purcell. So just like Elmsley's relationship with, with Sullivan, Elmsley's relationship with Purcell was very complicated. Uh, it had negatives and positives. And uh, ultimately, Purcell wrote that it was Elmsley's uh, uncontrollability that forced the end of the partnership in 1921. Um, so, uh, I, you know, Purcell may have been of two minds himself, you know, uh, he never published any of this stuff, even though he was writing magazine articles all the time uh, during the last several decades of his life, he published dozens and dozens of articles in all kinds of magazines and never took time to write a, an article uh, laying down all this uh, all this information about who designed what in the Sullivan office. So that's pretty weird as well. Um, I have a question. And you also mentioned um, that um, Elms, in today's parlance, Elmsley got thrown under the bus. I think another uh, more um, current uh, expression would be cancel culture. Yep. That's a term I've been hearing a lot. Yeah, well, that certainly hasn't always existed. You know, some people have been trying to get rid of other people. Uh, and that, that's what happened to poor George. Um, I'm going to, let's see, Tom Balcom asked a question here. Uh, National Farmers is an odd name for the bank. Did the words get out of order? Did Sullivan name the bank? No, that is the name that the, uh, the, the owners of the, of the bank uh, wanted to call it. And in fact, they already had that name. There was a previous building that was their bank building. Uh, and it was, it was always called the National Farmers Bank. And uh, so, you know, there's a reason for that. Uh, first of all, national, we all know what a, a national bank is. That means it's guaranteed by the federal government. But farmers was very intentional. Um, uh, you know, I showed uh, uh, an interior shot, a wonderful photo by, John Klaus, who's I think somewhere on this call. Uh, and um, inside of the bank, there are these two huge murals uh, on the two uh, walls that don't have the big round window. Um, and each of those murals is a scene of bucolic farm life. Uh, you know, one of them is a, is a field of cows. And so, you know, the, the bank in Oatana uh, was uh, was trying to get the business of all the farmers who live around lived around Oatana, uh, and th they loved it. You know, the bank was successful uh, up to a point. Actually, it went out of uh, commission. It was um, closed, uh, and I've read that this was pr possibly uh, actually unnecessary. That they probably did have the assets they needed, but. Uh, in the in the uh, the Great Depression, uh, 
which actually started in rural America in, in the mid 20s. Um, uh, that's when the bank was closed down and uh, that was uh, bad news for the owners. So anyway, that's where the name National Farmers Bank uh, comes from. Uh, and let's see, Bill Neuendorf, Neuendorf says, I've seen some resources refer to Sullivan and the architect while crediting Elmsley as the chief draftsman. Is that a fair description? No, I, you know, I don't think so. Um, the, there's, as I've, as I've said, uh, there's, the, the culprit here is modernism. Um, modernism, uh, you know, to, and, you know, at a very fundamental level, was all about getting rid of ornament in architecture. Uh, it, and Elmsley was, uh, that was his forte. Uh, he was the great ornamentalist. And he could, he could, you know, Purcell wrote, he could draw these things with never an eraser. Uh, and Elmsley wrote, you know, I did most of my designing in my head. And when my pencil hit the paper, it was all, uh, it was all um, pre-organized for me. Um, and so the, the modernists hated ornament and many still do. And the, it, it just isn't done much anymore. Uh, I would hope that uh, in this post-modernist age, we could uh, have a, a, a recurrence of the kind of uh, naturalistic ornament that Elmsley and, uh, and uh, Sullivan could draw. Um, the, the idea of connecting humans with nature is exactly what we need to do in order to get rid of climate change and uh, so many other kinds of problems. So there's a, a very uh, current relevance, I think, to Elmsley's architecture. Um, one, of the, one of the questions kind of ties in with this, and that's from Larry Lockman, and that's um, what was the overlap time in design uh, with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and Elmsley? Because yeah. you've got the art glass, the horizontal lines, windows, etc. Yep. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. The, if you look at Wright's designs, they are purely um, geometric. And Wright always you know, uh, uh, admitted that, that he, he could not do what Elmsley could do or what Sullivan could do. He, he always had the phrase, uh, I was a T-square and triangle architect. Uh, and so everything he designed is, is geometric. Well, he got that from Sullivan. Um, uh, Sullivan's very last publication is called a, uh, let's see, uh, I can't. I guess I can't think of the actual title, but it's a treatise on his on his architectural ornament, and he shows in a series of beautiful drawings that every one of his ornamental motifs starts with basic geometry. Uh, he and Elmsley, in different uh, publications, both said uh, the hexagon is our is our favorite. Uh, ornamental form because it's natural. You know, they point to uh, uh, honeycomb as and other uh, hexagonal natural forms, and so they would start with basic geometry and then elaborate and put all of the plant life ornamentation all around it and on top of it and inside of it and so on and, and so forth. Um, and so. Uh, that was, did I, did I, I think I lost track of your question, Joellen. <laughs> uh, what, 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 when was uh, Wright working versus Elmsley? Okay, I see. Yep, uh, well, they were very concurrent. Um, uh, they, they were born in the same year, 1869, and uh, Elmsley died in 1952 and Wright died in 1959. So their, uh, their careers were almost exactly congruent. And um, the, the uh, Wright, as I said, uh, was kicked out of Sullivan's office in 1894. He was bootlegging, as he called it. Uh, he, he, was he was taking commissions to design houses out in Oak Park and other places. Uh, and that was against the written rules of Sullivan's office. 
uh, and and Wright admitted that in one of his books. Uh, um, he had broken it's actually, windows. It was actually moonlighting. That's right, moonlighting uh, is the word he used. Thank you very much. Um, and so, uh, so, so Wright's, um, you know, soul uh, or his uh, his um, career on his own began at that point. Um, what probably the earliest house uh, is the Winslow House in Riverside, uh, uh, Illinois, uh, often referred to as the first modern house because of its horizontal orientation. Um, so, it, so that's when that's when Wright's career began, and Wright, Wright of course, went on to become America's most famous architect. Uh, at, at the same time that he was. Uh, that he was uh, painting pictures of Elmsley as a jerky uh, little Scottish guy who he didn't think much of. So uh, uh, Jim Hubbard has a question about, uh, I just lost it here. Um, what did Sullivan do after uh, Elmsley left as far as designing and getting it, get the work done, the office work done? Right, well, he did have another uh, chief draftsman um, can somebody re, uh, uh, re help me remember his name? Uh, it's not coming to me. Uh, but um, Sullivan, as I said, was you know on his downward uh, uh, spiral with with uh, drinking, and so he did very little uh, after Elmsley left from 1910. Uh, is is about the last time Elmsley uh, was uh, helping out, and that was with the bank in um, Cedar Rapids, uh, Iowa. Uh, it's unclear how much of that was by Elmsley. So that was about the last thing. And then, uh, as I said, uh, Sullivan produced six banks, small town banks, all about the size of the Owatonna Bank or smaller. Uh, he did a, a church in Cedar Rapids uh, that uh, actually, that I should have remembered, and that was another one that Elmsley helped him with. Um, and that was about it. Uh, there, you know, the, the Sullivan was by 1920, uh, by 1920 or so, um, completely out of step with what was going on. It was modernism, uh, and he was vilified for the ornament, uh, and uh, uh, people cherry picked. What they wanted from him, which was they they took form follows function and thought that it only meant uh, uh, that uh, a building should uh, express its structure on the exterior. Uh, that was not at all what Sullivan meant by it. Uh, as I said, uh, he thought that the most important function of any building was its spiritual function, and uh, and so. People were completely past that and didn't understand them. And furthermore, if you read Sullivan's books, there it's like plowing through the 1991 uh, uh, Thanksgiving snow uh, thing. <laughs> uh, Sullivan's prose is is purple, <laughs> and uh, he he writes metaphorically. He he hardly ever states his point. Uh, straightforwardly, it's very difficult to understand what he's getting at. And by his very last book, um, um, uh, it's right up on the shelf there. What's it called? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, Democracy: A Man's Search is his last mm -hmm. book, and it, it's almost undecipherable. It's a 350-page rant. Uh, and all kinds of non sequitur, and uh, you don't know what he's what he's getting at. And he, he must have been, uh, 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 you know, under the influence all the while that he was writing it. And um, uh, it, it's it's very sad. Uh, he deteriorated tremendously at the, hmm. at the end of his life. Hmm. Uh, we have a. I, I want to. Give a shout out to uh, uh, is it Mr. Mr. or Ms. Failing who lives in Purcell's house in Portland, Oregon. I've uh, stood outside your house and photographed it uh, several times. 
uh, and uh, I sure hope to uh, see the inside of it someday. Um, so uh, 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 thanks for the comment. Uh, so then, uh, um, Dick, go ahead, Ruth. Um, Max um, Halprin said that the Parker Noble Berry was Sullivan's chief draftsman after Elmsley right. left. Yep, Parker Berry. Thank you very much. Couldn't think, couldn't come up with the name. That's right. Uh, somebody says, what about Elmsley's later buildings, the schools in Illinois and Indiana? Yeah, that, the, the, the same thing that happened to Sullivan happened to Elmsley. Um, as I said, uh, uh, Purcell uh, cut the partnership in about 1921. Actually, I, I read a thing fairly recently, Purcell's uh, was commenting that, hmm, I see that actually um, uh, I have uh, um, work uh, by Elmsley showing up um, two years later than that. So even though he, uh, Purcell had moved to P Portland, Oregon, uh, that's where the house is that uh, Mr. or Ms. Failing was talking about, um, uh, he, he was still in touch with Elmsley for the rest of his life. So Elmsley was kind of on his own uh, he was uh, sometimes being bankrolled by Purcell, um, but um, he, was, uh, he was trying to do other banks. Uh, and in, uh, 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 what's the town in uh, Illinois? Um, somebody help me out here. Uh, Where's the road? Uh, just northwest of... Uh, Chicago. Uh, can't, can't think Aurora. of Aurora. Aurora, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, there's a bank there. There's a, uh, uh, another couple of buildings there. Uh, he did a bank in Topeka, Kansas that was demolished in the 1960s. Um, and uh, Purcell wrote a very negative appraisal of that bank saying that uh, Elmsley had completely overdone the ornament. It was out of scale, he thought, and uh, there was too much of it. Um, if you go to um, uh, um, uh, Sioux City, Iowa, uh, I showed you the picture of the, uh, the big courthouse there that Elmsley designed with William L. Steele. That was in about 1917, and Elmsley was still in Purcell and Elmsley, uh, but uh, he really moved to Sioux City for uh, a long period and was out of Purcell and Elmsley largely. By that time, Purcell had moved to Philadelphia. Um, and uh, so Elmsley had this a few of these uh, commissions that that county courthouse in uh, Sioux City uh, also, you could criticize the same way. Uh, you could say that it is overdone. Uh, almost every surface inside and out is covered with Elmsley's ornamentation. Um, and I, personally, I love the ornament. I, I love the allusions to, to nature and the, the idea of combining humans with, with nature. Uh, but uh, a lot of this negative appraisal of these things really grows out of modernism and it's anti-ornamentalism. Any uh, other questions or comments? Yeah, yeah. Right here. Did, did uh, uh, Elmsley die in Minneapolis? No, uh, he died in, uh, hi Tom, uh, he died in Chicago uh, after uh, he, uh, even uh, after his wife died in um, 1912. Uh, and she died in a hospital in Chicago. Um, at, at that point, he was so depressed that he went back to Chicago from Minneapolis and um, lived for the rest of his life with his sisters. He had, I believe, seven sisters. Uh, and uh, several of them lived together, uh, didn't marry for the, uh, uh, for the rest of their lives. And so he and his sisters were living in a house, a couple of different houses. So besides, besides this great, great uh, uh, work of art that he did over his life, he was kind of an unhappy guy. 
very much. Um, and, I, and I get the impression that, that maybe that started very early in his life. Um, he wrote that he was very, uh, you know, he grew up in, in Scotland in the, and, and not in a big city. He was from the highlands way up north, uh, uh, sparsely populated area. Um, and he wrote that he was very much influenced by the novels of Sir Walter Scott. And if you know Scott's novels, they're dreamy castles in the mist and you know that sort of thing. Uh, and so Elmsley was a shy, uh, withdrawn kid uh, and grew to be a shy, withdrawn adult. Okay. Great talk, thank you. You bet. Uh, here's a question. How did Sullivan's buildings get designed after Elmsley left? Well, they were by Sullivan, but also by the uh, other, uh, uh, the, the, the last chief draftsman who we mentioned. Uh, let's see. What was the, uh, um, Larry Lockman says, what was the overlap time and design between Wright and Elmsley, art glass, horizontal lines? Well, I guess I've really responded to that. Uh, how, next, how did Elmsley's style show in Purcell and Elmsley's residential projects when they were working together? Um, Elmsley was, as I tried to uh, emphasize at one point, uh, he was way more than just an ornamentalist. Uh, he was very good at figuring out uh, uh, floor plans uh, and circulation patterns and so forth. And one of the greatest examples of that is the Purcell Cuts House. Uh, and those of you uh, in, in, the, in Minnesota probably all know that well. Uh, for people who are um, outside of the Minnesota. This is the house that was designed for William Purcell and his own family. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, built in 1912 uh, and then uh, added on to a little bit uh, three years later in 1915. And there's, a, a, there's tremendous documentation uh, about the design of that house because this was at a point when uh, Elmsley had moved to Chicago uh, after his wife died. And, uh, and so uh, the, uh, all of the design conversation that would have happened uh, you know, face to face if they were both in Minneapolis actually happened via correspondence. Uh, and uh, that correspondence is saved at the Northwest Architectural Archives here in uh, Minneapolis. And um, a long time ago in the 80s, when the Purcell Cuts House was donated to the Minneapolis Institute of Arts by its last owner, Anson B. Cuts, um, I was hired to write a video script uh, about the house. And so I read a whole lot of that correspondence. And it's, uh, it's Purcell saying, how do, I, how do I do this? I want to have an open plan where the, the sunroom, the dining room, the living room, the entry hallway are all one thing. Uh, and it was Elmsley who had to come to the rescue and say, and, and there, he's, he's, he's writing uh, letters to Purcell and he's making little sketches in the midst of the text. And he's joking to Purcell and say, ha! You're missing a step over here, and I'll put it in, and we'll we'll get this all worked out. So, uh, Elmsley was more than an ornamentalist, and uh, and uh, Purcell wrote that for a given project in the Purcell and Elmsley office, uh, you know, was who had time to jump on something, uh, and and so there were projects that were mostly Elmsley's. Uh, design work and, and uh, layout, and there were projects that were mostly Purcell's. Um, and the, the uh, Purcell and Elmsley partnership was very productive uh, in the, you know, starting from the beginning of Purcell and Fike, which is 1907. That's when they moved uh, to Minneapolis. They were college roommates at Cornell. Uh, and it was Purcell's father who said, you should go to Minneapolis. They don't have one of these newfangled uh, 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 kinds of architects. And so you'll have uh, you know, uh, an open field to work in. 
And so they, starting in 1907 to the end of the partnership in 1921, they uh, actually got built more than 300 buildings uh, all over the country from, uh, there's a lovely house in Berkeley, there's, uh, there's uh, houses at Woods Hole, Massachusetts, there's uh, a house in New Hampshire, there's stuff all over the Midwest, of course. So uh, they were very prolific and, uh, and uh, each of the, the principals, Purcell and Elmsley, would, might, have, might have been uh, uh, mostly responsible for any given project. And uh, a lot of that uh, you know, detail, who, who did what on which project, Purcell wrote about. Um, if you go to uh, a website called Organica, O-R-G-A-N-I-C-A, Dot org that's produced by my good friend and colleague Mark Hammonds who lives in Los Angeles. Um, uh, Mark uh, has uh, published uh, all of uh, what Purcell wrote about individual projects. There, are, there's uh, hundreds of entries about who did what on each given project, and it wasn't just Purcell and Elmsley. Uh, there was George Fike. Fike was a structural engineer. Uh, uh, Purcell actually fired him. Uh, he didn't like to uh, move to get that around too much, but I found uh, un uh, absolutely clear documentation of that, uh, that he fired Fike. And the reason was that Fike had a very abrasive personality and uh, people in the office and contractors and clients didn't get along with him. Uh, so. But in addition to those three people, there were a whole bunch of other drafts people who worked for Purcell and Elmsley uh, on and off for the years that they were together. So there, was, there are projects that some of the drafters uh, took most of the, uh, uh, of the, the, did most of the work on. Uh, for example, uh, they, uh, they hired uh, probably the first female drafter in Minneapolis uh, in anybody's architectural firm. Her name was Marion Alice Parker. And there are quite a number of houses, especially the ones in Bismarck, North Dakota, that Marion Alice Parker uh, did a whole lot of the work on. Um, and if anybody has other uh, questions for me, uh, you can uh, email me at, uh, my, my email address is my name, Richard Chronic, no spaces, at msn. Dot com and I'd be happy to discuss it with you. Uh, by the way, I'll, I'll say one more thing. Uh, in addition to Dominic Ferry in uh, Glasgow, I have colleagues in Ljubljana, uh, uh, Slovenia, who are uh, waiting to see the presentation when it's posted on YouTube. Uh, so uh, can't, Great. I'm, I'll be looking forward hey, to hearing. Thank you all. It's been really fun to uh, have so many here and uh, for Dick to be giving us so much information. Really appreciate it. Thank my, you. My pleasure. Thanks. Good night, everybody.